Hey there fellow marketers, Professor Walters here, and today we're in Savannah, Georgia, and today we're going to talk about something that really drives marketers crazy, and that is how do we figure out how consumers decide what to buy? What are all those influences? What do we have to think about? Is there certain rules we have to look into? And so we're going to talk about that, because what you have to realize is every consumer has a different set of decision criteria, different things that influence them where they're going to go. For example, I'm here in Savannah, Georgia. Why am I here? Oh, it's got great history. It's got incredible food. We've got friends that live here. There's a beach nearby. All those things influence me into actually coming here for a little vacation with the family. So there's those things, but there's other things that are going to influence you. And a lot of times what it comes down to is what are called determinant attributes. These are all the little product features and differences that make a product different or special than their competition. In actuality, or just in the perception of the people buying or the consumers buying, I mean, Think about it, if you're looking at going into a university, what's going to be the deciding factor? What's going to be the determined attributes for you? Well, it depends who's looking, right? So if it's a student, what are they thinking? They're thinking, okay, what, where am I going to have a fun time? Who's got a nice dorm room I can live in? Maybe they have a, a, a degree I want to get. Like that's what their determined attributes are. Uh, they have my degree, I'm going to have fun and a good place to live. That's what they're looking, that's how they decide. But then mom and dad, what are they thinking? They're going, um, can we afford it? Will they get a job that they'll move out of my basement? Those are two different things we're looking at, or well, five different things, but two very different perspectives and determinate attribute sets that people make decisions on based on making decisions on where to go to college. And so you have to think about those things. What are those determinate attributes that people decide on? That's why you'll see in fast food, they'll talk about speed, right? We'll get it out to you 15 minutes or less on our lunch specials. You're not gonna wait more than one minute in the line at McDonald's on the drive-through kind of stuff because they know that people are making their buying decision based on that. I mean, think about it. When, I'm, when I only have 30 minutes for lunch, I don't have time to sit down and have a long meal. I need something quick. So my determined attribute would be who's the fastest lunch place, right? That's why a lot of times you go to lunch to the closest restaurant to your work because it's right there, not the best food, but I can get it done and get back in time for work so I don't get in trouble. And that kind of speed thing also relates to our next kind of criteria we look at, and that's the compensatory decision rule. Basically, what are we willing to trade off? I mean, if you think about it, I don't really want to eat McDonald's every day, but if, like, if I'm on a road trip and I've got an eight hour road trip, like, do I want to spend an extra hour at, at Cracker Barrel eating? I love their food, I love going there, they're super nice, but man, that's an extra hour, so my eight hour drive turns into nine, nine hours. So what I'm willing to do is I'm willing to sacrifice the tasty food and, and the sit down time for getting through the drive through quickly and back on the highway faster. So we'll trade off the speed, I'll go for speed over healthiness or speed over, over tastiness or whatever, because you're willing to compensate on these things, like trade off on things. And this is one of those things that the low cost airlines really survive on, because it's like, look, people are willing to sacrifice comfort and free bags for a cheap flight. So we're willing to willing to trade things off. That's that compensatory decision rule. But on the other side of things, you have the non-compensatory decision rules. These are things that no matter what happens, I'm not going to do it, you know? For example, like maybe you have a loyalty program. Like I fly a lot with Delta, they give me free upgrades. So even if the price on United is more, I'm probably gonna fly Delta because I'll get upgraded. And so it doesn't really matter what you do, I'm gonna fly with them. And this could also relate to things like, look, I can't spend more than 10 bucks at lunch. I have a hard cap there. There's nothing you can compensate for me. It doesn't matter if it's done by the world famous chef, I've only got 10 bucks. Okay, so you're looking at these sometimes like that. I have a friend of mine, her family runs a Pepsi bottling service, right? And then she's like, no matter what, it doesn't matter. I'm not drinking Coke because we're a Pepsi people. You have those kind of non-compensatory decision rules as well. Now, other things that can influence people, you have what's called decision heuristics. These are kind of like the feelings people have about products or attributes in regard to certain types of products or services or brands, certain things you associate with it. So for example, if you're going to buy wine, I'm guessing you're not a sommelier. Maybe you are, but I'm gonna guess you're not. And how do you know which wine is better? Um, the price, the more expensive wine should be better than the cheaper wine. Yes, in theory, that's how it is. That's decision heuristics. That's why, oh, the price gives us an idea what's going on. Oh, the product presentation. Wow, that looks really nice. That must be fancy. Oh, that, that Perrier water in its special bottle. Oh, it must be a fancy water. That, that's fancy water because it looks like that. There's certain things that you can do in order to get people to understand that your product is a little bit nicer or maybe better or whatever. And it goes both ways because think about it. 
When you walk into a Walmart or a Sam's Club, you walk in and you know it's gonna be cheap or walking into Aldi, cause you know what? You don't see fancy outfits, right? There's no outfits right there. You know, they got a vest on or something like that. There's not a lot of fancy displays. It's all like, it looks cheap. So therefore like, wow, if they didn't spend money on all the, the, the extra stuff, that means they can have that to save money on the end products. Yes, that's why your Target milk costs a lot more than your Walmart milk. Because you go into Target, it's really nice in there and you're willing to spend more because, oh, it's showing it looks nicer, I'm willing to pay more for it. But Walmart knows if we look cheap, people will buy us and they'll know that we're cheap. Probably why if you look at Walmart's website, it doesn't look very fancy. They've got the money to make it look really fancy, but it doesn't fit with their brand. It doesn't fit with that decision heuristic that's basically saying, that, look, we have to look like we're affordable. We have to look like we're cheap so people understand that we're cheap. And that can also work with the decision heuristics, also can work with brands. I mean, how many of you eat Kellogg's Corn Flakes or Kellogg's Fruit Loops or Kellogg's Apple Jacks or Kellogg's Pops? You know, you have all these Kellogg brands. And so Kellogg's knows that people identify their brand with the nicer cereals, not the generics. And so they can use that. So sometimes people use that decision heuristic. Oh, that's a Kellogg cereal. It must be pretty good. It must be the fancier one than the generics because some people don't buy generics. So you kind of think about that. And what we as brands and companies have to think about is we need to realize all these things and realize some of these things we can use to our advantage. Some things we need to be kind of fighting off. So for example, if we know that people have, you know, they're willing to trade off price quality. Well, yes, Mark might really like his Delta flights, but if Qantas comes in and says, hey, Mark, you know, the flights on Delta are two grand. We're willing to sell you a flight to Australia for 500 bucks. I'm like, man, that's, I mean, I love my Delta, but $1,500 difference times four in our family? Uh, yeah, I guess I will go there. That's why you'll have some of those Groupon deals and other stuff, because they're trying to inspire people to get them over their hurdles, right? So you have to think about that. Another thing you might do is really develop a really strong brand that people identify with. So they know, oh, that university is a really smart university. So I want my kid to go there because the people that go there are smart. So my kid will be seen as smart and they'll get a good job. You have these kind of things, okay? And so you really got to take this all into account when you're looking at how people, how consumers evaluate their alternatives and decide which one to go for. So you really need to have all these in mind when you are trying to understand consumer behavior, okay? So I know this was a lot of stuff on here. I hope it helps you better understand a bit about consumer behavior and their decision-making process. If you want to learn more, hit that subscribe button. We put out new marketing videos all the time so you can learn all kinds of good stuff. And I'll say bye from here in hot, humid in August, but beautiful, wonderful architecture, fantastic food, Savannah, Georgia. See, I, 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 those things are way better than, than those, okay? <laughs> bye.